Thank you for tuning in to the Drug Science Podcast. Just before we start, I have a very special announcement to make. On the 14th of July, Drug Science will be officially launching the Medical Psychedelics Working Group. This group will be comprised of drug science experts, academics, policy specialists and industry partners. To celebrate this launch, we'll be hosting a free online event open to the public. We'll be exploring how medical psychedelics could and should be integrated into Western psychiatry. To find out more and secure your tickets for this event, please click the link in the show notes below. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. A Fascinate Productions podcast for drug science. Hello and welcome to uh, another drug science podcast. I'm David Nutt and today we've got the first of three podcasts that are looking at the issue of veterans, PTSD, trauma. In America, there's Jesse Gould and in Britain, Keith Abraham, both of whom are working for a new charity called Heroic Hearts, which has been set up to try to raise money to get as many vets and other first responders treated with psychedelics for their PTSD. I'm going to ask Jesse. Jesse, why don't you say a bit about yourself and how you came to found this, uh, this project? Of course. Pleasure to be here, Professor Nutt. So I'm Jesse Gould. I am calling in from uh, the United States. I'm currently in Florida. My background is I was an Army Ranger, which is a special operations position in the U.S. Army. And I served that a number of years, including some combat deployments to Afghanistan. During my time, I I learned a lot. I served as leaders of of 30-plus other Rangers, had a very profound experience. Um, And when I got out, I was ready to retackle civilian and professional life. So I went back into finance. But it was around those times that I really started having to contend with some mental issues that I tried to ignore for a while and tried to self-medicate with Mm -hmm. alcohol and, and, you know, just activity. Uh, But it it just, the dark cloud consumed me at a point to where I just realized I had to make a major change. And the U S as, as many other veteran affairs around the world and just mental health in general are, are obviously very limited in what they can provide. And uh, through my own research and through my own journey, I I found a substance called ayahuasca, which is a psychedelic compound that comes from from the Amazonian cultures in South America. Mm -hmm. And just from the profound effects it had for me and my life, it was obvious that this information needed to be spread to a much wider audience, including uh, fellow veterans. And so that was the inspiration and and the, the origin story of Heroic Hearts Project. Come back to your story and your journey in, in a minute. So, Keith, so you, I think, were also looking for some relief. But tell us a bit more about your, yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm a British military veteran. I was uh, served in a parachute regiment for eight to nine years. Much like Jesse, I have a very similar experience. I um, had a combat deployment to Afghanistan in 2008, which was pretty intense. While it was um, a great experience for, for a lot of the time, it also came with a lot of trauma. Eventually, over the course of a few years, I realised my military career needed to come to an end. And again, much like Jesse, I actually walked into a job in the corporate world, in the finance sector. But in that environment, I began to realise that I was struggling, that I was carrying some of my traumas around with me. I found myself disappearing into the Peruvian jungle uh, one spring and uh, in a little wooden hut in the Amazon basin somewhere. Uh, A shaman came to visit me a couple of times and gave me some ayahuasca. And I walked out of that jungle, a very different person to the one that I walked in. I still had a lot of hard work ahead of me, but again, much like Jesse, I knew that uh, I had been changed, but I also knew that a a conversation had to be started and that I needed to spread this, uh, the viability of this therapy to other veterans and, and to our wider society as well. Fantastic. So I think it would be really helpful for those, I mean, most people don't serve in the military, most people don't know people who serve in the most people don't know what these what these sort of impacts of trauma are. Could either of you just briefly, in a, in a way, explain how they did disrupt your life? 
when you were back on Civvy Street trying to do ordinary things? Yeah, of course. And uh, what we're coming to understand is that there is a very complex nature to this trauma. And it is probably also the reason that the, the current treatment modalities have failed and where psychedelics seem to be succeeding because it's complexity with complexity and it, it tends to mesh very well. So for my personal side of things and from other veterans that I've worked with, the trauma can relate to a few different means. You know, some of it's obviously stemming from childhood and just continues over. There's mm-hmm. the, the the one that most people think of, like you see a very traumatic event, yeah. a brother yeah. dying in your arms or, yeah. or just that stress yeah. battle. But there's much more subtle ones that come afterwards as well. One that they're discovering is brain injury that comes from constant exposure to concussive force, yeah. like explosions. Yeah. And then just also when you get out, there's an extreme lack of purpose and lack of brotherhood. So you're going from mm-hmm. almost polar polar situations where you're surrounded by friends, you're surrounded by people that will risk their lives for you. And you're doing something that is in this community where you feel like it's for a greater good or it's for something. And then if you go like myself into corporate world where you spend 70 hours a week and you might have saved them a few bucks at the end of the month, it has a – it's kind of a letdown in comparison. It's almost the opposite, isn't it? Out there, you're trying to screw other people over. It's almost the worst thing you could go into would be the financial sector. I thought it's so damn cutthroat. But so what did you experience, Keith? How did, you know, how did you find that your life was still being damaged by your experiences? The best way of putting it, I suppose, is a lack of an education on how, how I might go about helping myself just on a personal level, taking, trying to take responsibility for myself but also that what was being provided, what was being offered just wasn't cutting it. So I went to my local GP, got two options, yeah. which was talking therapy and antidepressants. I tried both. Antidepressants definitely didn't work. Talking therapy had their value, but really didn't get to the root cause. And uh, I think that's an experience that's shared by many, regardless of where we are in UK, US, anywhere. And so the time came for a relatively extreme option. But can I just ask you to say a little bit more about, I mean, were you having flashbacks, for instance? You know, most people don't understand what PTSD is and if you could, sure. could perhaps. So for me, I just talk on a, on a, for a personal experience, I was, I found myself incredibly hyper aware in all circumstances, yeah. just, you know, shopping in Sainsbury's or uh, just walking around the streets, but also I was physically very tense. I was so tense in my abdomen, so tense that it was like being in a stress position 24 hours a day, even in sleep, trying to rest. And that caused me to, I had like excessive sweating and, and just this constant, yeah, it felt like a constant stress position that I was being asked to maintain and it's unsustainable. Uh, so I, I eventually began to break down. I couldn't maintain that. And um, uh, uh, to be honest, I'm pretty grateful for that because it made it forced my hand. I had to go and deal with it in my own way. Yeah, that being on edge all the time must be very unpleasant. I, I remember seeing a, a film called From Shock to Awe, and one of the people in there, you know, his, every time he drove, he was reimagining that he was going to be a victim. You know, Jesse, did you want to? I mean, are there other? For me, for me, is more of the chronic stress. I, I was fortunate that the flashbacks tend to be more what that the the trauma I was mentioning where you see stuff. Yeah. So I've worked at this point with a lot of vets that have that. Fortunately, that wasn't what was affecting me. me. Mine is much more of a, like I said, this cloud that I could still function in life, but it was just really holding me back. A lot of veterans describe it as baggage. And so similar to Keith, like if I'm in a crowded area, it's just sort of this hyper anxiety. I would be much easier to go into anxious states, to panic attacks, Mm -hmm. or even depressive states. And that Mm -hmm. was the scariest part because that would be everything you view is just gray. And so you're pretty much just going through the motions, go to work because you have to, and you know on a logical level that -hmm. this is what you have to do to survive and sustain yourself. But there's just no real, there's no color to the world. There's There's no point really in, in a lot of ways i think that's really important what you've said because you know there is a sense in which people think well you know okay so you've seen nasty things and we can we can stick you in a chair we can do some eye movement desensitization and you can see the nasty things and then you, you they don't freak you out but it's much more than that isn't it it's this the fact that it changes your brain in a way where you you end up you know being unable to think properly you may actually have cognitive problems because of the the explosions and that and it's it's way more complicated than just having an image that you want to wipe out yeah 
for a lot of vets, that hypervigilance too, it's almost mm. like the light switch is stuck on the on position. Yeah. Uh, and they, they, what we're seeing is that possibly psychedelics can reset that to where it's no longer always in this, this heightened state. Well, that's what I hope. And we'll come to, we'll come to that in a minute. Jesse, you haven't told me what treatments you had before you, you sought out ayahuasca. Well, so when I came to it, I, I really tried to self heal in, in whatever capacities I had in, in terms of what they, they recommend for anxiety, for depression, in terms of learning new activities, uh, being more social, journaling, meditation, the whole the whole docket of that. I tried to seek talk therapy, but financially I wasn't able to. And through the VA, they essentially, the, the Veteran Affairs in the U.S., they essentially said, unless I went on medication, I couldn't see a therapist. Wow. And I wasn't interested in going on medication. And so it was all pretty much the mm. affordable ways I could possibly heal myself. I see. I see. Self-help. Yeah. It's interesting because yeah. I'd, I'd assumed and that, that actually the, the Americans looked after their vets a bit better than the Brits. God bless the NHS. Well, that's true. Yeah. I mean, did you get to see a specialist at all, Keith, or was it just your GP? Uh, no, I went to see a specialist. I saw a couple. Um, a couple didn't work out. You know, it's, the relationship is ultimately as important as the therapy. And a couple of that, re I mean, it really didn't work. But I was very, very lucky that one of them, I connected with her and she connected with me. So it was useful. But again, it only took me so far. One thing that actually I will add that has on a daily basis helped me while the, while the medicine has caused that kind of catalyst of awareness that mm -hmm. helped mm -hmm. me deal mm -hmm. with the my struggles on a daily basis it's actually the practice of um, the internal martial arts like tai chi is a popular one it changed it's changed my life i actually teach that now as well it's changed me to that degree it's, it's not all about the medicine it's not a panacea it's not a heal, no, no, healing no, no, no. all you've got to put in the work after on a daily basis whether that's journaling like jesse said which is i also do but it's important to understand that you've got to try and work through this daily almost continually yeah you've had life-changing experiences and you know you are a different person as a result of actually going to war yeah so both of you sought out ayahuasca who wants to go first jesse what was the impetus or the knowledge you had to to make you move in that direction there wasn't just one moment that changed my perspective but i did come from a very sort of conservative viewpoint of it no psychedelic history no even illegal drug use i, I had that similar view of it of hey this is just recreational people are mm -hmm. using it for escape i didn't define myself as that so when i first heard about it through social media i kind of just cast it off and just knew that wasn't for me but as i said my life just kept getting darker in a way and and more more days were unhappy than were happy and at some point the some sort of internal mechanism just flash that that warning light of hey you need to do something otherwise you're gonna go to like a spot that you can't turn back and ayahuasca i don't know i read about it and i think because it had all this culture around it all the ceremonial side and there was some there one there wasn't that much of a recreational aspect to it i think that's really what allowed me to convince my mind that hey this could be a possible uh, avenue and where did you go to get yours so I did research and, and found that the sort of hub is a place called Iquitos uh, in Peru. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's really kind of grown to be sort of the, the, the area where you go. And so I looked into it, saw which centers I thought looked legitimate, given, <laughs> given this, that it was something I had no idea, and found a place. And, and it was isolated in the middle of the Amazon. Takes a while to get there. But that, that isolation was, was great. Mm -hmm. And Keith, you did your, your research on the on the internet, did you as well? No. Or did someone tell you about it? I could be wrong, but the way that I remember it is that I just felt this calling that there was something else available. And a friend of mine that I, I didn't really talk to too regularly, she mentioned that she'd felt the same way and that she'd come across ayahuasca in Peru. And so that was my first contact with it. I did no research uh, before that, but her personal experience and what she was telling me was ultimately very convincing. And it just sold me straight away. So I just thought, you know what, I'm in a place where this intuitively I understood that this would be important for me. And um, I found myself in this tiny little wooden hut 
just deep in the jungle, miles from anywhere, and uh, with no running water or electricity. And it, it was that um, isolation that Jesse just spoke about was really, really important for me at that point. I'm interested you say that because, so I've talked to a few other vets in Britain now who are going to Spain and having ayahuasca, but they, they're going as a group. They're going as, a, as, you know, the team that they were together with when they were, you know, in, 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 at war. And, but you actually, both of you went alone. I mean, that was quite, quite courageous, I guess. I think it's also the sign of the times, you know, with, with the project, with Thrill Carts, we're mm. actively trying to change that because it does enhance the healing if, if you do have people that know the ropes a little bit or the support group there. You know, when I went, one, I, ju I was just too afraid to tell anybody else because I thought they would think I was crazy. Uh, and even though it was, it was relatively recently, there still wasn't that much out, that much information about it. And so mm -hmm. just to give it a shot without having anybody hold me accountable, I, isolation was the, the, the spot I chose. We'll get back to the interview in just a second. I just want to thank all the Drug Science Community members for your continued support. Without you, the dissemination of information like this would not be possible. Drug science is, and always will be, independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. But by becoming a Drug Science Community member, you'll be helping us bring about change. You'll also receive access to exclusive events and will be able to attend all Drug Science events for free. To see how to become a community member, click on the link in the show notes. Now, where were we? Let's get back to the show. As you know, I've done quite a lot of research on psychedelics, particularly for depression. Until a couple of years ago, if we, I was asked, you know, would, would psychedelics be good for PTSD? I would always say, well, I'm not sure. I'm a bit worried that people might have a bad trip and it might, you know, reignite all the horrible memories and that. But you guys, are, you're the pioneers now. You're the ones that are telling me <laughs> what I should be doing. And I'm, now I've got to reformulate my, uh, my thinking as to what is going on, you know, because it wasn't exactly <laughs> what I predicted. But what did go on? Tell us about you know, how, how, how it affected you, how it helped you. Leading on from what you just said there, it's actually a very nurturing experience for me. That's just my personal experience was that, mm -hmm. and, I, and I really needed that. Coming from an ultra-masculine environment of, of a combat unit that I was in, I really actually mm. needed to be nurtured. That was really the probably the most important aspect of it is the, the way that it presented itself to me during the experience, this nurturing uh, that was just so profound and wonderful and healing. I didn't actually get shown all the horrors of war. It was just an education more than anything, it just like psychotherapy, but just at such an advanced level and such a personal understanding. Um, mm, mm. It was just mm. profound is the only word that I've got. So there was no, it wasn't a formal psychotherapy for PTSD. It was an ayahuasca experience you both went and had ayahuasca that helped your ptsd and your depression you yeah i didn't have any integrative experiences after or right. before ah. for me it actually kind of goes more along with your initial theory and your initial hesitation because it was definitely a hard and, and a physical experience but also a lot of the vets especially a lot of these special operations vets it can be a very intense dynamic and I can understand the hesitation, but that's actually where you're getting the most effect, I think, with, with those guys. That's what they say a lot about psychedelics is it gives you the treatment or the healing that you need as opposed to what you want. And so what, what we've kind of seen, and obviously it's, it's early on and we need more people looking into it, but it seems almost like a modified prolonged exposure therapy where they're already using this as a, as a derivation of cognitive behavior therapy where they have people go through the story. But with the talk therapy, the limitation is oftentimes people can't, they can talk through it, but they can't pass on through the emotional side of it. And so it's almost like eating a dead horse where they just get stuck at that wall. Mm. Whereas psychedelics connects in, a, in an odd way, the logical side and the subconscious and the emotional side. And so when people are exposed to sometimes these negative stories or these traumatic events, it allows them to move on from the story. And what I've seen also is veterans almost get uh, trained to think in this very negative way or their brain gets caught in these feedback loops where they're constantly in that sort of negative state. And what the psychedelic aspect does is sometimes it can keep making them be in that state until they finally submit and their brain realizes that it no longer needs that. And so they have this almost 
this resurrection from that that point of okay, I'm done. I'm done with this mm-hmm. this negative thinking. Like I I don't need to beat myself down. I don't need to have this guilt. And so that's really where we're seeing some of the power. And as Key said, no matter how hard it pushes people, there's always it never pushes you past this level. That we haven't seen any sort of risk of psychotic break or anything along those lines. It pushes you to where the person needs to, and oftentimes that's where they submit to the change but if it gets too intense then there's always almost this soft cushioning yeah excellently put so you've uh, you had the both had the, you had the experience jesse and then you decided it was time to to roll it out so you set up heroic hearts project so tell us about that project please yeah of course so as i was saying i came into it extremely skeptical and even throughout the process uh but just the change I saw myself on a almost therapeutic side, my thoughts and my brain felt differently afterwards. And it just really struck me, I think, especially because of the difficulty as something significant that I couldn't just, you know, cast away as, as placebo or something else. And, you know, I, I kind of let it, uh, the integration process, I, I continue to travel a little bit and just let whatever settle, settle. And I continue to do research. And I saw that there was early indications of people looking, scientists, researchers looking into it for the use of depression, as well as other psychedelics, you know, the, the, the history of LSD and, you know, all the things that you're, you're very familiar with. Uh, And so I saw that there was this potential and it made sense. It made actual sense of this, this being something. And just from my own experience, I thought at the very least, other guys I know deserve this information for them to make an informed decision on their part. It's not for me to push it on anybody. It's not for me to say this is gonna cure everything else. But if there are other people who are at the end of their rope, similar to myself, which there are unfortunately a lot of, they should at least know that, hey, maybe, maybe it's a one in 10, maybe it's a one in 100 chance, but there is this thing that these centers, these cultures have been doing for decades and the culture has been doing for millennia. So there, there is that safety dynamic to mm-hmm. it. There is just so much anecdotal evidence to support this that you can really not ignore it. Exactly. What is Heroic Hearts then? Tell us about what it is. Are you a charity or are you a, a therapy or are you an educational system or what? I try to stay away from therapy because, you know, we, we can't really I don't want to step on the, the official side, the professional side. We're not trying to make ourselves as, mm-hmm. you know, medical advisors or a therapeutic in, in the traditional sense. But we are a registered nonprofit in the U.S. and, and Keith is, is working to make it a registered nonprofit in the, in the U.K. Um, and so at the core, it's it's a donation based uh, organization where we connect veterans who are interested, who come to us with safe means of pursuing this on their own. So that includes information, that includes outreach into communities, veteran communities and otherwise, and a network of support to where if they do decide this is right for them, we answer the questions, we verify that there's not any uh, medical safety uh, issues in terms of if they're on medications, Mm -hmm. if there's a chance of it interacting or heart conditions, psychotic issues. And then we provide them coaching throughout. So that's preparation. It's also the integration follow-up. And to your earlier point too, one of the ways that we make sure that that they get this desired effect, even if it is hard, is that preparation side. And we found that really enhances the results. If they know that this could be very challenging, but the challenge is just a obstacle that they can overcome. And at the end of that process, they will be better, they'll be lighter, then they're more prepared for it as opposed to this full frontal assault of the psychedelic world that they have no concept of. So you prepare them and then they get an air ticket and fly to Brazil or Peru, do they? Or And then they come back and then you do integration. Is that how it works? Yeah, correct. Uh What about Keith? Are are they going to Peru like you or are they going to Spain and other places that are slightly nearer? Both, short answer. But there's centres that I trust in Peru and that Jesse can attest to that I, you know, I trust his previous vetting. We're sending veterans out to Peru. We were already meant to be out there, but because of COVID, we got delayed and uh, postponed. So we'll be doing that at the beginning of next year. We've got a trip out to Peru for our ayahuasca. So you take a, you take a group out yourself? Yeah, but again, um, just confirming what Jesse was saying is that I'm only there as a kind of like to hold hands in the, all of the professional and the 
facilitation of the the ceremonies themselves are done by the retreat centers and I, I want to make that perfectly clear but also what i found valuable is that psilocybin has also been of a great help to me personally and that's where a retreat center in the netherlands is is going to start helping us uk vets because it's so much closer it's a little bit more viable for us but the dutch government just recently outlawed psilocybin um, ayahuasca so oh that's a nuisance I mean, we use psilocybin because we um, because we know what it is. When you, when you, if you want to research, if people could do science on ayahuasca. People say, "Well, what the hell is it? Prove to us, <laughs> you know, it's ninety-eight. But you know, how do you prove that ayahuasca is ninety-eight point nine percent pure? You know, I mean, it. Maybe you should explain, Jesse, what I, for those people who are listening who don't know what ayahuasca is. Do you want to give them a brief account of of what it is and how it's prepared for these sessions? Yeah, of course. And, and uh, to what you're saying, the reason why psilocybin has, has really become the, I guess, the, the token psychedelic, the organ- uh, plant-based psychedelic, is because they found a way to take out the, the chemical or the alkaloid psilocybin from it, and then they're able to study that, control it. Um, with ayahuasca, the, the main psychedelic or hallucinogenic compound is called DMT, uh, which is very similar to psilocybin. But ayahuasca itself it comes... Uh, from at the very basic, the combination of two plants found in the Amazon jungle. So one is a vine, and then the other is a leaf. And only in combination, when they're prepared, will you get the psychedelic effect, because the vine has something called an MAO inhibitor, and the leaf has the DMT, which is a psychedelic. And the MAO inhibitor changes the chemistry in your gut to allow you to ingest the DMT and that your body to process it. If you were just to eat the leaf or DMT like that, then your body would just pass it through like nothing else. Uh, and so it's this, you know, pretty amazing combination of the two that puts you into the psychedelic state, which generally lasts for about four hours. And the reason why it's so hard to research is because it is almost, you know, it's like a, a cooking concoction. It's a, it's a tea uh, and it depends on plants as well. And so every plant has a little bit different concentration of DMT or the MAO. Uh, depends on where they're coming from, what part of the, the Amazon. And every every shaman will use a slightly different combination uh, to, to their desired results. And just the whole nature of what we're doing includes a lot of uncontrollable variables, which will make most therapists sort of shudder at, at the the lack of control of it, but the, it, it has been evolving for, as I say, like millennia through the tribes. And, you know, it's not, they're not adding any dangerous features. It's just ceremony. It's song. It's, it's all sorts of the it's other, what we call experience enhancers, which really get people where they need to go, provides that safety sort of atmosphere for them and actually flows very well with the psychedelic experience. Keith, you've, so you've tried both ayahuasca and psilocybin. Could you tell them apart? Yeah, actually, quite quite easily. I, like I mentioned before, the ayahuasca I found very, very nurturing. It was still, it's a, definitely an intense experience for sure, but the overriding feeling of it was one a very forgiving, very nurturing. Whereas my experiences with psilocybin was more, I always put it, and, and again, this is just my personal experiences, but I always feel like it's um, back in a military environment where he really, he really puts me through it. You know, really, there's, there's no the nurturing isn't there. It's really, okay, you need to get this done and dealt with. Come on, let's go. Let's attack it. Again, that's just my perspective. But they're, they're, they're equally valuable. Um, I would say that I prefer the nurturing experience of ayahuasca, but undeniable power of psilocybin is clear to me. Hence why, as a UK charity or soon-to-be charity, registered charity, we'll we'll be offering uh, both opportunities, psilocybin and ayahuasca. And that's the value of having Keith and meeting Keith because, you know, no matter what, our, our cultures are even slightly a little bit different. And so appealing to the local UK vets, even something in terms of using psilocybin or the comfort level of going to South America, you know, I can't really speak to that. I can speak to, to my own sort of demographic. Uh, and so that's really the valuable part of having Keith and having him, you know, steer the ship over there. Well, I mean, it's fantastic that you've actually, you know, you're in two countries and I, I suppose, you know, you could roll out internationally and I guess you're going to be needed. Um, but let me ask you a few other things then. But are, are you just for vets then? 
So for the one in the U.S. Uh, at this time, we are. I think Keith is exploring other other options. But for the U.S., unfortunately, the problem that we're dealing with is already so overwhelming within oh, the veteran community that we're at capacity. You know, our, our our waiting list here, so waiting list of people looking for financial scholarships to go is 200 plus, uh, and we are we only have a very minimal outreach, and so just that overwhelming demand for this indicates we, we already have our hands full. We, we would eventually like to expand to first responders. And then the main purpose of what we're doing is we think that through the veteran voice and through these communities, it will naturally be more appealing to a broader audience because especially in the U.S., veterans have this sort of position to where they can talk to a lot of different demographics. Yeah, yeah, quite, quite. And so hopefully even the more conservative minded or the, the communities where there's more stigma, that veteran voice can sort of be that bridge. Well, presumably the veterans, if the veterans administration were to get behind you, I mean, it, might, it would surely be sensible for them just to fund it because it, when people are so much better, then they're presumably much less of a drain on the veterans pension schemes and things and their health care. And that. I mean, wouldn't that be logical? Unfortunately, logic and sensibility are not a uh, prevalent commodity <laughs> at the yeah. at the current time. <laughs> Is that because the drugs are illegal? Yeah, and, and with specific regard to the veteran affairs, it is a giant bureaucracy that is mm. subject to federal laws. So even if it had the best intentions of adapting these new treatment protocols, its hands would be tied until the federal guidelines change. And then that gets into a very messy catch-22, and the people at the top generally have very little interest. No, but I've suddenly realized, of course, in, in America, where you've got 31 states have got medical marijuana, I think it's still not allowed to the vets. Is that right? Because they're in the federal health system. That's, that's exactly right. And that's the veteran affairs can only acknowledge that it is an option. They cannot go forward of, of recommending it. They cannot provide therapy. And so essentially you're, you're leaving met veterans to self-medicate with marijuana, which is unfortunate. And that's also the reason why, even though everybody has known there is some medical benefit to cannabis and cannabinoids, there's been embarrassingly little research done on any of it. As you say, embarrassingly little. I mean, a great thing about that, I mean, you have a couple of groups in the States doing, you know, you've got New York Uni and you've got John Hopkins who are, are doing some very nice work on, on psilocybin for depression and end of life. And uh, maybe you could persuade them to, to get interested in PTSD as well. Oh, the we, we, we've recently talked to Johns Hopkins and mm -hmm. they have something in the works. So obviously everything's a little bit delayed, but mm -hmm. they're they're definitely uh, interested in pursuing psilocybin down the line for, for PTSD. And coming back to Keith then, so how's it setting up in Britain? Tell us a bit about your experience of getting the charity up and running and, have you, and, and how many people have you got aligned with you? On a personal level, it's just been a really wonderful experience setting up the charity and really, really kind of life affirming the amount of support and the, the team I've managed to build around myself is that that has been a wonderful experience in and of itself but I'd like to just go back to talk about what yeah. charity actually provides and while Jesse was talking about just having to keep it just for military veterans I found that because our society here in the UK is a little bit more guarded towards the use of psychedelics I've decided to open it up to uh, UK military and emergency services veterans as well, so police, fire and paramedics. One, we don't have the same numbers involved as the US does, and two, as a society, we are less inclined to see this as a viable option, so I, I foresee that the numbers will be less. But hopefully, through our good work, hopefully the numbers become more, and, and hopefully also the funding matches those requirements as well. Mm. I was... In PTSD, obviously, as a as a psychiatrist, you know, you see people with PTSD. You, you know, from the very first day, you start working in psychiatry. But about twenty odd years ago, thirty years ago, maybe we started looking at the nature of the physiological responses and the flashbacks and that in PTSD. Working with people from the British Navy, and um, once we started to run a clinic, I realised you know it's uh, it's not just the military. I mean, in fact, the, one of the areas the people that we found very commonly had PTSD were the um, guards on the railways who were going out and picking up the bodies from people that had jumped under trains and, and the drivers were really traumatised, you know, it was because of course there's nothing they can do, they're just driving the train and suddenly smash, you know, and so I, 
I think you know. I, I applaud you for broadening it if you can, because it, there's a, a lot of a lot of unpleasant, un difficult to treat trauma across the board of people working in the the field, those sorts of fields of helping others. Yeah. yeah, there's there's yeah there's a huge need across the whole of society in both of our countries and, and beyond as well, of course. But um, just if I can, I just talk about the team that I've got around yeah. myself. It's just because it's such such an awesome team. We've got Crispin Blunt, MP for Rygate. He's co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group for drug policy reform. So he's an incredibly powerful ally that we've got on board there as one of our trustees. And he's ex-military as well. He is as well, exactly. So, I mean, it's just and that's, all slotted together. So he's an MP that's actually done something in the real world, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a rare a rare breed. Well, that, I have a lot, of, a lot of time. In fact, I'm going to interview Crispin. I mean, I have a lot of time for him. Yeah. Carry on. Um, yeah, I mean, like I say, a really powerful ally to have in, in Parliament. And I'm talking to other MPs, also ex-Parachute Regiment members as well, about hopefully getting more MPs on board. But then we've also got uh, Ollie Ollerton, who's ex-Special Forces guy who's on the TV at the moment, who does the SAS Who Dares Wins. You know, he's a wonderful guy. And a real, um, Jesse actually took him out to Costa Rica for his ayahuasca experience, which is how I got to know Ollie. And we've also got uh, Charlotte Walsh, who's a, a mighty lawyer, a legal mind, to help us out on that front as well. But um, on our advisory board, we've got Professor Jo Neal at Manchester University. She's a oh, professor. I know of, very well. Yeah, yeah, she says hi. Yeah, <laughs> I'll interview her one day. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> you, I mean, yeah, what a brain, what a mind. It's fantastic. So, yeah, I'm, I'm surrounded on all sides by incredible characters and, and beautiful minds and sharp brains, so I, I feel like we're in a great place to start moving this forward now. And are you talking to UK military charities at all? I mean, they, maybe they see you as competition, I don't know, but I mean, because there are sort of helpful heroes in that. Yeah. Can you have a dialogue with them? So a little while ago, there was a little bit of issue with military charities and, their, and how they use their funding. So what I've, who I've spoken to in the background is privately, they really generally support what we're trying to do. But publicly, for, for much of the same reasons that Jesse just mentioned previously, publicly they can't support it because the people that are behind the scenes of those charities, it would have implications for them and they, they just can't move into this space. But they can send you, they can send you people in need once you're ready and running and, yeah. and hopefully put donors your way. Yeah. yeah, that would be wonderful. And we are having those conversations, so let's, let's, see, let's see how that develops. Excellent. That's sort of how we had to operate in the U.S. There, there are the, the the ice is breaking, and there have been a few corporate partners, and there have been a few established charities that are moving more towards our side. But it's generally been the the newer, upper coming ones that don't have as much of the the traditional grounding. And so we've just been providing information sessions. It's hey, you don't have to actively support us, but if there are people there, we'd be happy to share this in as straightforward a way as possible. But all sorts of perverse things happen. I don't know if you heard about uh, what happened to us last week. We were doing crowdfunding for uh, a study I want to do using psilocybin for OCD. And Stripe, the company that collects credit card donations, their computers said no. And for a week, we couldn't collect money. Why? Because we were collecting money for an illegal drug and their systems didn't allow them to collect money. I mean, I went ape and I, eventually they, uh, they, unloos they loosened it. But, but these kind of unthinking, knee-jerk reactions that people have, it's, just, it's really, it's, you know, it's, such, it's, it's an unnecessary burden to us because what we're doing is difficult enough as it is without having those kind of blocks. Hopefully we're, when we, if we get enough you know, veterans behind us and we can just go to Stripe and <laughs> see if they still want to shut off the funding. Yeah, I mean, all the, yeah, I mean, it's just a channel for the fight. Well, I suppose it's a bit like you have in the states now. You know, cannabis is a medicine, but you can't put the money into the bank when you sell medical cannabis. Yeah, right. the, the absurdity. I mean, the, oh, don't get me started on the drug laws. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> it's twenty years of my life I've been battling them. I want to ask you a, a, a slightly more sort of medical question. I mean, how do you you talked about meds? I mean, we found that we have to get people off things like antidepressants when we're or antipsychotics when we're putting them uh, giving them the psilocybin is the same true for ayahuasca do you try to get people tailed off those medicines or does, do they block the effects of ayahuasca yeah so we have certain protocols with who we accept and given the small our small status and small infrastructure you know obviously we're already dealing with a lot of 
issues and risks, so to speak, here. Uh, and so the last thing you know we want to do is cause more harm than good. That that would be the horrible sort of outcome. And so on our application, we deal with that. The retreat centers that we work with have a secondary medical evaluation, and so there's that uh, okay. twice good. checking. Uh, with ayahuasca, it's it's similar, but probably even more dangerous than, than psilocybin because of the MAO inhibitor that will uh, interact negatively with SSRIs, SNRIs, some other medications. You know, we, we have to vet to make sure they're on that in terms of if they have heart conditions, family or personal history of psychosis. Some are no-go, some you can work with in terms of the medications. But at the very least, they need to have a trained professional to work with if they want to get off the medications. That's not our job. And I I won't allow people that just go off cold turkey just because that's too dangerous with those. And so they they have to be off of it for four to six weeks, depending on the, the half-life. Oh, oh, right. So you, okay. Well, yeah, I guess if it's Prozac, it would be four weeks. Yeah, that's 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 tough, isn't it? In itself, that's quite tough because people can get withdrawal reactions or they can sit back, you know, things can... You know, it's the same as we have to do with psilocybin. And are there any other things things we haven't covered that you wanted to say, or apart from to ask people to support you? How how can they support you guys? I mean, have you got websites they can donate to? The U.S. based one is heroicheartsproject.org, uh, and we're on all the social medias, mostly Instagram, Heroic Hearts Project, and in both sides, it's it's all donation supported. Uh, so every single dollar goes to supporting vets get there. Uh, and you can find the no-nation side. And Keith has his own uh, website. Yeah, so for UK vets and emergency services vets, we're at heroicheartsuk.com. And we're on Facebook and Instagram at Heroic Hearts UK. Again, fully donation-based. Our registration application is with the Charities Commission at the moment. They're reviewing it. And so hopefully before long, we'll be able to take our own donations. But in the meantime, we can accept donations through jesse's project and those uk donations will be used for uk participants so we're we're all set we're covering bases uh, that's great and one thing i just wanted to say i mean what i would be really keen to t- see if we could do some research with you guys because I, I am i am fascinated to, to be proved wrong ayahuasca and psilocybin does work for ptsd and I, i'd really like to see if it's working in the same way as it works in depression so so at some point, you know, let's uh, let's try to get together and uh, and raise some money and do a bit of brain scanning as well, if that's all right. Wonderful, yeah. I think we uh, we should get a group of MPs and David <laughs> yeah. can lead it, and we'll take everybody to the the Amazon. Maybe we should make it compulsory. You can't you can't be an MP unless you've had a some kind of mind expanding experience. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, it's been lovely talk, wonderful talking to you both, and uh, you too, thank you for spending the time. And, and great luck with all your uh, your enterprises. It's so vital, and uh, yeah, I will talk to you a lot more in the future. I hope. So, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Been an honor. Thank you very much.